Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings and the mercy of God be upon all of you. Welcome back to the next episode of the proof that Islam is the truth. And today we're going to be talking about the scientific miracles of the Quran. Those statements in the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May God's peace and blessings be upon him that are truly remarkable, that beg the question, how could such information be in a book 1,400 years old? You see, scientific knowledge depends upon the gradual advancement of information. We can only know a certain thing in scientific terms when something has been studied and observed and examined. And of course, the ability to study and observe and examine something depends largely upon what is available to us in order to be able to do that. So for example, how much can we know about the stars and cosmology if we don't have access to powerful telescopes and different ways of interpreting and gathering and then interpreting data from the universe around us? How, for example, can we know about the earth, the earth's crust, the formation of the earth without sophisticated instruments able to measure it? How could we know, for example, about the details of human embryonic development without the sophisticated processes available to us today in order to be able to acquire that information? This is something concerning how scientific knowledge comes to us. What if we were to come across a book, an ancient book, 1,400 years old, and this book was going to give us information. It was going to reveal facts that we have only discovered recently through our hard-earned scientific method of investigation. And that now, after continued observation and gathering of information, now we know, yes, these are facts, these are things that are true, but no one knew those things 1,400 years ago. No one even had the possibility of knowing those things 1,400 years ago. Then surely this begs the question, where could such information come from? Where could a book so ancient have received such knowledge that is so modern? This is the question we are going to be exploring in the next few episodes of the proof that Islam is the truth. And what we want to remember is that the Quran is a miracle for all times. It was not only a miracle for the Arabs living in Arabia 1,400 years old. For them, the language of the Quran, its structure, its rhythm, its whole meaning, was a miracle for them. They would hear the Quran as we've shown and they would embrace Islam. It was enough for them. They knew that no human being could produce a work like this. We are not Arabs. We may hear the Quran, we may find it beautiful, we may not find it beautiful. So the linguistic miracle of the Quran, the, the miracle of the Quran's language, it doesn't mean that much to us. But we do believe that the Qur'an is a miracle for all times. It is just as much miraculous for you today as it was for those people living 1,400 years ago. But the way it is miracle, the aspect in which it is miraculous is obviously going to change because the things that we consider to be important today are not necessarily the things that the Arabs considered to be important 1,400 years ago. And just as poetry and language was what the Arabs living in the time of the Prophet Muhammad were so proud of, they were so proud of their linguistic abilities. Today, I think we could safely agree that it is scientific knowledge that we are proud of. We are so proud of the ability and the achievements of science. In fact, many people will hold up the achievements of science as one of the defining characteristics of the superiority 
of Western civilization. In fact, there is no doubt that the achievements of science have, by and large, in recent times, been a product of Western civilization. And there's no doubt for that reason that many people today are in awe of the West and the power and the ability of the West. We study in universities based upon the patterns of Western institutions. English is the lingua franca, the international language that is spoken all over the world and in which many different studies are performed. And all this is really connected with science and the advancement in science and technology. So the Qur'an is a miracle to the scientist. The Qur'an is a miracle to the people of the 20th and the 21st century, just as it was a miracle to those people living in the desert 1,400 years ago. Now what we plan to do over the next few episodes is to introduce to you some of the statements and explain some of the statements in the Qur'an that are of a scientific nature and that have proven to be in accordance with modern scientific knowledge. Now, before we go into it, I do want to mention a very important matter. And that matter is that the Qur'an is not a scientific textbook. The Qur'an is a book of guidance. In the Qur'an, Allah says, Alif la meem, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي خُدَّ لِلْمُتَّكِينَ Alif la meem. This is the book, without doubt. In it is guidance for the pious people. So the Qur'an is fundamentally, essentially, before anything else, it is a book of guidance. It is a book that teaches us who is Allah, who is the Creator, that there is only one God that is worthy of worship. It tells us also that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the Messenger of God. It teaches us morals, what is right and what is wrong, how we should behave with each other, how we should behave with the world around us. It teaches us the stories of those pious people who have come before us so that their lives and their examples could be an encouragement for us so that we could further better ourselves. And the Qur'an also warns us of those people who have disobeyed God, who have sinned against God, who have transgressed the limits that God has laid down and the Qur'an warns us and tells us about the fate of what has happened to those people. The Qur'an is a book of law. It teaches us the laws through which and by which we should govern ourselves according to the wisdom and the knowledge of the mighty, the wise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Qur'an is not a book of science, but... Without doubt, we believe, we know, that it is from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And therefore, it is not unreasonable to expect that the information that is contained in the Qur'an should reflect the perfect and absolute wisdom and knowledge that is from God. We should expect, of course, that a book that is from God to be consistent with the reality of the universe around us. Since God is the creator of the universe, and God is the creator of all things, and God is the one who knows everything, surely a book that is from God should be consistent with what we can observe to be facts. Now importantly, we are talking here about facts. And so what I have tried to confine myself to are those aspects that are very clear and that are very obvious and that are not ambiguous. We're not talking here about so much scientific theory, although, of course, in a philosophical sense, every statement 
in science is a theory. Everything is a theory. It's only in the eyes of scientists a theory that is very, very strongly proven with very, very strong evidence as opposed to a theory that may have very little evidence or perhaps even no evidence at all. And so scientists put their faith, as you could say, they put their faith in those theories which simply offer the best explanation and have the strongest degree of evidence. However, we have really only tried to select those statements from the Qur'an that are supported by the strongest degree of scientific evidence. And again, we only say this because the Qur'an is not a scientific textbook. It's not a book of science. It's a book of guidance. But we should expect that it does not contradict the reality of the world around us. So I have chosen some of those statements in the Qur'an that have also amazed and fascinated me personally. And I remember that when I first read the Qur'an for myself, one of the things that astounded me about the Qur'an was that it lacked the fables and the fairy tales and the type of fantastic statements that you would expect from a book that was revealed 1,400 years ago. In fact, what I discovered is that its statements were truly amazing. We will be talking about some of those things after the break. Don't go away. Stay there for the proof that Islam is the truth. Welcome back to The Proof That Islam Is The Truth. I'm Abdurrahim Green and I'm going to be talking today about some of the amazing statements in the Qur'an concerning the natural world. Some of the amazing findings that we find in the Qur'an that agree with present scientific observations. Amongst most or amongst one of the most remarkable of them are without doubt the statements in the Qur'an dealing with the development of the human fetus. Now it's interesting as a comparison to see what was the state of knowledge at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. Because you would expect a work that has been made by human beings to reflect the ideas and the concepts that were prevalent at the time. If Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had invented the Qur'an, had authored the Qur'an himself, most certainly he would have picked up the ideas that were normal amongst the Arabs and the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and so on and so forth. So one of the prevalent theories was of course the Aristotelian theory and Aristotle was one of the people, one of the first people to really begin to make scientific investigations and theories as to the origin of human life. When I say one of the first people, certainly in the Western world, he was one of the first people. And also he's one of the people whose statements have been recorded and preserved for posterity. There may, of course, have been others. But his theory was very, very common. And his idea was that the male sperm acted as rennet in cheese to congeal the female menstrual blood. And from the congealing of the female menstrual blood, the human embryo was formed. Now he based this upon his observation that when women became pregnant, their monthly periods ceased. And so he theorized that therefore something must happen to that monthly period and what happened to it was that it congealed in order to form a human life. Now of course we realize at this time that such a theory is completely false. Even as late as the 18th century a man called Hartsoker claimed to have seen through a primitive microscope various sperms of different animals. And so looking through this primitive microscope, he claimed that he could see inside the actual 
sperm a preformed human being, a little child crouched up. Similarly, he claimed that in the giraffe sperm, for example, he could see a long neck, and in the rabbit's sperm there was a big ears and stuff like that. And this was known as the preformation theory. Of course, again today we know that that is false. And it's an example, of course, of those type of theories that sometimes float around in science that later show to be false and even quite laughable. And that's the case with both Aristotle and the ideas that were prevalent in the 18th century. And it's not really until the 19th century that we began to develop an accurate description of the stages of human embryonic development. Now, what we want to examine is, what does the Qur'an say? If the Qur'an was a forgery, if the Qur'an was invented and written by Prophet Muhammad, as people claim, then surely it would reflect the ignorant beliefs of the time. However, it does not. Let us read the 23rd chapter of the Qur'an, verses 12 to 16. The meaning of it is this. We created man from a quintessence of clay. This, by the way, is referring to the creation of Adam. Muslims believe that God created Adam miraculously, not like the rest of the creation. He took clay, Allah took clay from different places in the earth, and he formed from this clay the shape of a man, and he gave life to this form, and thus Adam was created. And from the rib of Adam, Eve was created. So this is what Muslims believe. And so when Allah says, we created man from a quintessence of clay, this is talking about the creation of Adam. But the Quran goes on to say, we placed him as a drop. And the word in Arabic is nutfa. Nutfa means a drop. In a place of rest, firmly fixed. Then we made the drop into an alaq. And I will tell you what these words mean in a moment. So first, we praised him as a nutfa. Then we made the drop into an alaq. And then we changed the alaq into a mudra. And then we made out of that mudra bones. And then we clothed the bones with flesh. Then we caused him to grow and come into being and attain definitive form. So Allah is mentioning the stages. Nutfa, alaq, mudra, laham. Okay, so these are the stages. And then we begin to look like human beings. And Allah goes on to say, Blessed be Allah, the perfect creator. After that, you will die. Again, on the day of judgment, you will be raised up. It's very important, my dear listeners, that Allah, at the same time as He is mentioning these amazing and astounding facts that science has only discovered recently, immediately afterwards, Allah is reminding us that you will die and you will be raised up on the Day of Judgment. Just as Allah created you in stages from a thing that clings, from an alaq and a mudra, and from laham, from all of these things, Allah most certainly will create you again on the Day of Judgment. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nutfa means a small drop that is omitted. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to this nutfa as both belonging to the male and the female. In fact, he mentioned that these nutfa are mixed in the creation. This is what he mentioned in on authentic hadith. The nutfa, the, the drop from the man, which is the semen, and the, from the woman, which is of course the ovum, their, their nutfa, the small drops, they are mixed. So this is very important because the Prophet is mentioning that the human being comes from both the man and from the woman. This already goes against the theories that were prevalent at the time. Secondly, the word alaq in Arabic, what does it mean? It has three meanings. A thing that clings, a blood clot, 
and a leech-like object. In fact, all of these things accurately describe the first stage of human embryonic development. After the fertilization of the egg, our blastocyst develops, which has on its exterior villocytes which literally cling to the wall of the uterus. So they're little, it's rather like um, Velcro. They cling to the inside of the uterus in the womb. This is what happens to this alak, a thing that clings. And then it goes on to resemble exactly a leech-like object. The similarity is absolutely remarkable, not only in appearance, but also in behavior, because a leech also takes blood from its host. Similarly, the alak stage also takes nutrition and blood from inside the mother. So this is, it goes on and it also resembles at a later stage after that, a blood clot. So this is the first thing. The word alaq describes exactly the first state of human embryonic development. This is not something that could have been known 1,400 years ago. It is impossible because this stage of human embryonic development is something that only can be observed with powerful microscopes. Yet, description is accurately mentioned in the Quran 1,400 years ago. So it mentions then from the alaq stage, it becomes a mudra. A mudra means like a chewed piece of flesh. And this is exactly what it likes. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the Quran also said, partly formed and unformed. So it has bits that are slightly formed, bits that are not. And if again you look at this stage, it looks exactly like a piece of meat that has been chewed. Then the amazing thing is that the bones precede the development of the flesh. The bones come and then on the bones the flesh grow. Although the, the time between the growing of the bones and the flesh is very, very close. And it's very interesting that the word that is used, the term that is used in Arabic, the word is, indicates speed. One thing following another very, very closely. Even the structure of the words in Arabic are consistent with the development of the human embryo. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when 42 nights have passed over the conceptus, Allah sends an angel to it who shapes it and makes its ears and its eyes and skin and flesh and bones and then he says, O oh Lord, is it a male or a female? And your Lord decides what he wishes and then the angel records it. It is also true that you cannot determine the sex of the fetus until just after 42 nights. How did this information come to a man living in the desert? One thousand four hundred years ago. Most certainly this is the evidence that the Quran is from Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. Join us for the next episode of the proof that Islam is the truth. And until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.